Uranium is mined in only a few countries, but it's found in massive amounts dissolved in seawater everywhere. Scientists in Alabama are exploring how a simple crustacean could play a crucial role in filtering that uranium out of the water. The idea of mining uranium from seawater sounds like something out of science fiction. Yet chemistry exists today which could make this reality. Professor Robin Rogers is a pioneer in green chemistry and one day his work could result in the ocean mining of uranium. At the University of Alabama we found that we could selectively extract a useful polymer called chitin directly from shrimp shells and that we could modify this into a sorbent that would allow us to obtain uranium directly from the ocean. No matter the colossal amounts of uranium dissolved in seawater, given the size of the oceans, the challenge is how to get enough out of the sea. There are only trace elements per liter of water, so refining sufficient amounts of uranium will require vast farms. There's more uranium in the ocean than on any known land deposits or even guessed land deposits. Now, of course, the ocean is really big, so it's dilute, but there's no question that the amount of uranium in the ocean could satisfy mankind's needs for nuclear power for many, many generations to come. Professor Robin Rogers and his research team are exploring the use of a new polymer developed from chitin, a natural biopolymer obtained from shellfish. They want to create mats from this material, which, once put into the ocean, will attract uranium like a magnet and capture it from the sea in a practical, affordable and sustainable way. Uranium is extracted from seawater by a process known as sorption. We actually take a polymer sorbent, put it in the ocean and it attracts uranium selectively, allowing us to take it back to land and use it. In order to have an impact on the supply chain, however, any process must move out of the laboratory and be demonstrated at a larger scale. Professor Rogers' technology has been spun out into a startup called 525 Solutions, which won a Department of Energy grant to scale up the lab-based process. We are using uh, ionic liquids to extract a biopolymer from shrimp shell waste, and you are using chitin, the biopolymer, to manufacture the nanomats. The process of making sorbent consists of two stages. The stage number one is a dissolution of crustacean biomass in a special type of solvent, a unit liquid. And the second step is electro spinning of this solution. Most of the world's uranium is mined in Kazakhstan, Canada and Australia. The cost and efficiency of nuclear power could be improved if its fuel was more accessible and affordable. The application of pioneering science like this could potentially change the future of the nuclear industry. With terrestrial energy sources depleting, the future of nuclear power has to rely on more environmentally and renewable resources, and our process can provide that. If the refining process continues to be developed with these biodegradable uranium capturing mats, it's one way nuclear power could become part of a truly sustainable energy future. Fusion. It's the reaction that powers the stars, and it could create pollution-free energy for all. But can it be replicated here on Earth? We've travelled to the south of France to visit a project where scientists are designing and building a plant to create more energy than it uses. Our sun shines 24-7 bathing our planet in light and heat. It is an essential component for life on Earth. But could it also be used as a shining example for a clean energy future? 35 countries are collaborating on a project here in the south of France to reproduce the process that powers the sun, nuclear fusion. If successful, this could be the first step towards near limitless clean energy. We need some alternative option in order to provide enough energy to the world. Fusion technology could fit all these requirements. It is safe, we have sufficient raw material to fuel this type of reactors for millions of years. We have no impact on climate and environment. So it is all this asset we try to demonstrate with this uh, research facility. 
Nuclear power today is generated by a fission reaction, while at the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER, they're attempting to achieve the opposite, fusion. Fission is taking a very large atom, like uranium. You hit it and it splits it apart into two pieces. Whereas fusion takes very two small particles, it fuses together and gives off energy. Fusion is a technology which could replace polluting fossil fuels, a new option for a sustainable energy future. So the sun up there is around 15 million degrees Celsius. What we're trying to do with the tokamak, which will be over here, we're trying to create something that's 150 million degrees Celsius. And the objective there is you need it to be really hot to take two charged particles and slam them together to fuse. And the two charged particles are both positive. Normally they don't want to touch and you have to give them the energy so that they can actually combine and fuse together. And so our problem with fusion is, how do you create a bottle and put something in that bottle that's 150 million degrees Celsius? One of the designs for such a bottle is in the tokamak, a name derived from the Russian acronym for a toroidal chamber with magnetic coil. A tokamak is a weird object. It looks pretty much like a donut. And so it's a, it's a metallic chamber in the form of a donut or a bagel. And then around that, we create magnetic fields that, that build around the donut. And that creates, in a sense, a, a loop of a magnetic field. And that magnetic field holds in these charged particles. And so the tokamak is effectively a form of a magnetic bottle that holds this hot gas called a plasma in place. Some believe that fusion is a pipe dream. But what matters, and the point of ITA, is to find out whether or not it works. We are, I would say, at the, the next stepping stone to be able to create a fusion reaction that actually gives off more energy than it produces. If ITER is successful in creating fusion, the project will be the first sign that clean fusion power is commercially possible, with a process that will produce 10 times the energy it uses. Bill, we've seen real progress being made at ITER. Now, is fusion just a pipe dream, or could it really become a net producer of energy? Well, that's what the ITER project's all about. ITER is our countries coming together to answer that question once and for all. Can fusion play a role in the future? Uh, the tests performed in this facility once it's operating will help us answer that question. Now tell me, Bill, in your opinion, to what extent do you think nuclear energy can be considered a sustainable energy source and why or how? Well, in my view, it is a sustainable energy source. Uh, nuclear generates electricity, produces no CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. The waste is very manageable. It doesn't present a, a threat to the environment because we know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And uh, nuclear plants operate for 40, 60, even 80 years mm -hmm. of safely and effectively. So I believe it is a sustainable energy source. But every country, I think, has to make that decision for itself. So we have the cost of infrastructure and the amount of time that goes into planning nuclear energy. So how can we plan for our nuclear future? Well, we have seen around the world, there are many countries that have become very good at building nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. The ability of a nuclear power plant is something of an art form, mm -hmm. as well as a high technology activity. And it takes practice. And if you don't have suppliers and managers who are practiced at building these facilities, you can run into problems. Mm -hmm. In countries like Korea, for example, where they've been building continuously for many years, mm -hmm. they're very good at it. Mm -hmm. And I think that they show that once you have a system in place to, make, to put these plants together mm -hmm. effectively, um, you can plan very effectively for the long-term future. I think it can work. But um, what we do in many countries is we have first-of-a-kind projects every 20 years, mm -hmm. and that's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. Bill, thank you so much for having us today at the Nuclear Energy Agency. It was a real pleasure. I had a great deal of fun. We've seen how nuclear power can provide electricity to meet growing demands at less than 6% of the emissions of natural gas. If we are to achieve the 2050 decarburisation target, the International Energy Agency expects nuclear to be the largest contributor to the global power sector at 17%. We hope we've given you an insight into nuclear and of course we want you to continue the conversation on Twitter. You can find us at CNBC Energy using the hashtags AskSE and Sustainable Energy. Next time we'll turn our attention to another low carbon emitting electricity source, wind power. So if you've ever wondered how wind works, 
whether or not it can ever provide us with reliable power or if it's just a technology blowing in the wind with no way to store it, then tweet us your questions and we'll put them to our expert in our next episode of Sustainable Energy. In the meantime, keep thinking green. Goodbye. Goodbye.